So hi, I'm Mark Gabrielski. Uh, I'm the virtualization architect and ambassador over at WEI, a reseller in Salem, New Hampshire. Um, I've been working in IT for about 25 years. Uh, I've been certified in uh, many different facets as an acronym collector. Uh, had acquired my v first VCP back in 2003. Uh, got my VCDX in 2009. So been certified as a VCD expert 10 years. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, we're welcome. just going to go through some questions about your VCDX, um, which is an exciting certification. And the first thing that I wanted to know was how much time did you spend preparing? I actually measured it <laughs> uh, because it was quite a few weekends. Uh, uh, I spent essentially 200 hours uh, doing the preparation work uh, for the VCDX paperwork, the actual submission. Um, now, that was based on a actual customer design uh, that was uh, being delivered. So basing it on an actual customer design, um, I spent probably 100 hours of that 200 hours making the submission uh, specific for the VCDX. Uh, the end result was my customer got a great design on top of it all, um, but uh, I, I did put a little extra effort in then I, uh, just to make sure I hit all of the requirements that the VCDX uh, had outlined for me in its blueprint. Great, and then what happened afterwards? So after I received the VCDX, um, you know, uh, the expectation was, you know, great, another certification. Uh, in reality, what had happened was the company I was working for at the time, uh, my direct manager uh, was very appreciative, uh, showed me a lot of support, uh, but leadership didn't seem to care, didn't want to uh, take advantage of that and use that with their existing clients. Um, and it made it very easy for me to find another job that was going to be challenging me, that was gonna let me take it to the next level. Now what? Where do you go from here once you have a VCDX? Um, what's the next natural step in the progression? So after you get your VCDX, uh, you know, you should really try to take it to another level after all of the celebratory, celebratory uh, fun is over. Um, get yourself into account executives uh, if you're working with a reseller. Uh, if you're working at a company or, um, or a partner, start working with the different business units. But encourage, you know, encourage them to take advantage uh, of that certification. Um, you know, it's VMware calls it out. And if you ever read any of the boot camps or any of the, uh, the published works that are out there, uh, Pat, Pat Gelsinger does uh, some of the forewords and he uh, explicitly calls it the PhD for working with a uh, virtual, um, the virtualization stack, the SDDC that VMware now has. Uh, and there's more than one VCDX track. So, uh, there are quite a few folks out there who have gone and become double VCDXs uh, and challenged themselves that way. Uh, and there's even one, only one individual who's done the four VCDX tracks. Uh, so uh, there's, you know, if you want to continue measuring yourself uh, with certifications, that's great too. Uh, I recommend getting yourself out there and practicing and actually helping others. Um, you know, uh, whether that's a customer and you're helping them with their design whether that's team members who are looking to go ahead and grow themselves personally and professionally. Uh, you'll see that a lot of the VCDX community, all those folks that are certified, constantly give back. Uh, they're, you know, nobody makes money helping others. Uh, it's just a sense of, uh, it's very rewarding to see others have that potential to grow. I had mentors who definitely took me from just being an engineer uh, to being a solutions architect and a, you know, a true architect for my customers' benefits. Before you got your VCDX, um, what was your biggest challenge um, in preparing or in going through the process? My biggest pro uh, challenge is when I was approaching the VCDX uh, was that the program was so new and there was no guidance available. There was one blueprint document, uh, very similar to the blueprint document uh, you all see today. Um, granted, nowadays it's much more formalized. But you have this one blueprint and that was all of the guidance that was available. So trying to infer what, what was required of me was a, was a huge challenge as I started that out. How do you approach this documentation? What are they really looking for? Um, and just taking your, your best effort uh, to try to extrapolate from that, that blueprint what was required. I think today, 
uh, between all of the blueprints, all the published works that exist out there, uh, the, uh, the study groups, the, the VCDX workshops that are held around the country uh, in the US, they're held across, abroad, and more importantly, they're held online uh, at least once a quarter. All of these resources now exist to help folks prepare, which in, in hindsight would have been great if I had that. But you know, as you started out of the, v, the VCDX program, those, thing, those resources just didn't exist. So the first book that uh, in the IT Architect series is uh, the foundation in the art of infrastructure design. Um, and it's a practical guide for IT architects. A little bit of Socratic method um, that is part of that uh, as we present a couple of full-blown uh, designs um, around a bad case study, bad on purpose because you never have all the information when you start a design. So trying to keep that a little realistic. Um, but more importantly, uh, as you go through the book and read the designs, uh, they're based on old designs, but that's done on purpose because that allows one of the chapters to focus on what you would do differently and prods the reader to rethink um, basic decisions made during a design um, that now, you know, four years later, three years later, you can take advantage of newer technology and how that affects the design. Something as simple from three-tiered storage to how that fits into the SDDC uh, stack. Um, the second book, The Journey. Uh, is written by Melissa Palmer, also of the CDX. Um, and that's a great book for those who have never had to self-motivate themselves. And for those who have gone through these types of programs, it's a great uh, flashback into what we real, all, really all did as we tried to learn and spread our skill sets uh, across the data center uh, and the infrastructure requirements uh, that are out there. And a third book by Damon Baer, um, who is an aspiring VCDX, um, is designing risk in IT. And uh, it puts right there on paper all the things that architects think about on a daily basis. The trade-off for performance, uh, security, vulnerability, recoverability, around cost. And there's always a trade-off. Uh, I can give everybody the most secure, resilient design possible, but the amount of zeros required <laughs> in the budget for that to happen uh, just never seems to come out. So making those trade-offs and designing for risk in IT. What is your favorite VMware product or service? So my favorite VMware product um, uh, at home is obviously uh, VMware Workstation or Fusion, depending on your platform. Uh, the, you know, one of the things that it allows someone to do uh, as they're getting started uh, cost-effectively is fire up a window and, and have another operating system. It was, it's really just cool and an enabler. Um, but as far as like putting things into production, um, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a purist and a classic. Um, I've always uh, appreciated uh, ESXi since the day it came out um, because it did one thing for me that I still think is invaluable today. And I believe most uh, financial officers who were not around in the 1990s and the early 2000s uh, just really don't appreciate. And that is that ESX uh, can abstract the hardware layer uh, for your operating systems that you're running as virtual machines. Uh, the days of actually having to find and manage operating systems and their driver sets and their firmware iterations dependent upon the hardware that is that is in there is, is almost gone. We, we do that now for ESX servers and we have a compatibility guide to, to steer us, which we would do regardless. But one physical server, one ESX server runs 20, 40, 80 virtual machines, depending on its config. Uh, so it really removes a lot of that. So that risk that was always there whenever we had to manage all of our operating systems going forward uh, for firmware and driver updates and security, uh, most of that has been mitigated and now provides that consistent layer um, to those virtual machines, those workloads. Let's talk a little futurism. What's sure. the coolest innovation you've come across recently? So the coolest innovation that I've seen recently is not even out yet. So uh, we're, we're hot off the trail of VMworld 2019 US. Uh, we're just about to see VMworld 2019 Europe. Um, and there was a lot of excitement around uh, this term, the Project Pacific. Uh, which is really an enabler of Kubernetes workloads. Um, so running containers uh, in a manner where it's develop 
it's uh, native for developers to use using their tool sets um, and their manners in which they like to consume while still giving the traditional VM uh, admins that exist out there, giving them their view, their tools and, and blending those two products. Um, so that way the VM admin can manage resources, disk space availability, uh, and the developer world can go ahead and consume Kubernetes uh, in the way that they expect to consume Kubernetes. Uh, I'm really excited to see how that's going to be changing as we leave 2019 into 2020. All right, let's go back to the future. Um, what do you think will happen in the industry in the next five years or so? So the next five years in the industry should be really interesting. Um, you know, we're starting to see containers uh, become normal. They're not that scary uh, construct anymore. Uh, so as we start to see newer applications come out, uh, I think we're going to have the ability to start consuming um, some sort of container orchestration uh, to provide our the same workloads that we've uh, accustomed, historically we've uh, we've just loaded up onto a Windows machine or onto a Linux machine to deliver our applications. I really think that the, the vendors are gonna start slowly taking advantage of those new, uh, those new uh, tool sets that, that can really uh, make applications simpler to manage, easier to update, uh, and definitely bake in some availability. Things that we, we, we don't get with most of the traditional uh, Windows type applications that exist out there. Uh, I believe uh, this this construct of cloud. Whether you, you know, people start have started to realize cloud is not a place. It's 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 a way that you you think about and the processes around your data center and how you approach the design and deployment of your workloads. I think that that's going to start to mature um, and get general industry acceptance and the ability to plug in to whether it's AWS, the IBM clouds the Azure environments or your own existing private cloud that runs in your infrastructure, you know, that full lifecycle management, the orchestration, uh, those types of changes in IT uh, are absolutely coming. Uh, the traditional IT admins, they're gonna change from spending a lot of time doing the work to a lot of time designing and orchestrating what they would like the environment to look like. So that desired state um, and you'll, you'll hear that over and over again as you start working towards uh, and with containers, uh, that desired state configuration. Um, I think that's going to be a, a change in the way that IT admins normally do things. I think also um, a lot of IT shops are going to become tighter with the, the business. What is the goals of the business? What is the intent uh, that the business expects from IT, a level of availability or performance? Um, I think that those groups. Um, who are really isolated and siloed today, I think they're going to become, um, there's going to be a partnership there that just grows and has to grow if we uh, want to take uh, our environments uh, and mature them going forward. What's your favorite thing to do outside of work? I'm a geek. I still love, uh, outside of work, I still love to get involved and, and tinker with computers. Um, there's Today, while we're doing this call, <laughs> today's a PTO day. Uh, I'm here participating in the community. I've been downstairs playing in a home lab uh, in my office. Uh, I mean, a lot of, lot of folks who are involved in this uh, really spend a lot. I mean, this is your primary, uh, this is my primary, uh, my hobby. Uh, I happen to be lucky that I also get paid for my hobby. Uh, but if you go even beyond that, I mean, You'd see a lot of the uh, IT community. We're still uh, a lot of us are still gamers. We still see each other online. We still compete. Uh, and events like VMworld, where we all get together, you'll see that there's quite a few of us that still um, drop, drop down and play games. Um, a lot of folks have different interests, but uh, I think that's one that we all share it as kind of a common core background. What do you wish someone had told you earlier in your path? that is that people skills matter. Um, I do remember in, you know, as I got started in this in the uh, early 90s and into the early 2000s, uh, that I was an engineer who was focused on speeds and feeds and memorizing hardware specifications and what was gonna perform better uh, from, a, from a technical perspective. And for the most part, I was, you know, I was right in the conversation, but um, 
the business didn't need that. The, the people skills didn't need that. I wasn't able to read the audiences. Um, and, you know, I was going to the meetings armed with that technical deep, technical details uh, and, you know, not able to understand something as simple as a salesperson uh, asking how someone's family was and building that relationship. So if I had learned how to focus on the relationships um, first, I think that that could have made me a better engineer or a better architect in a very, in a shorter time frame. Uh, you can't get rid of those soft skills and they're very hard to teach. Uh, so if you can find someone who's willing to help you down that part of the the journey, uh, take advantage of it. Um, what are what are the benefits of certification for somebody that's new coming into the space? As you get started working in IT or or considering starting to work in IT, uh, certifications definitely play a role in that. Um, when I was getting started. Um, I had no real world computer experience. I had my, uh, my Novell Netware certifications back in 1995 and proceeded to approach places uh, who worked with Netware. So as I was going through and, and approaching the, and looking for work, having freshly minted certifications, um, it allowed organizations to take um, that, that potential risk of hiring someone with no real world experience. Uh, it shows that you're motivated um, and you know, as you start getting in, into a position, once, you, once you're in the industry, once you get your first job, whether it's help desk, whether it's uh, user support, uh, whatever it is, um, it's a great first step because once you're in, then you can start to take advantage uh, of all your teammates and start sharing knowledge. You have uh, context now as you take on your next, next goal or your next certification. Around certification, um, you'll see that around VMware sponsored events, VMworld, VMware user groups, the, the user cons, they call them. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a VCDX workshop that is offered um, as well as the one that's online. So even if you're just at a VCP level, even if you're just uh, getting to that and getting prepared for uh, the advanced certifications, definitely something that you could go and spend some time at and, and take in what a high level architect does. Even if you're not ready uh, to take those steps, the networking that's gonna go on, uh, meeting those individuals, um, making it easier for you to talk to folks online, um, building that network uh, of peers that you can communicate with and interact with. These user groups, um, these events, they're held. There are so few people that go to these VDA workshops. I mean, 15, 20 people at a user group attending the session. Um, I think that they're, if it was made, I think if it was made clear that this is for everyone, even those that are not at that most advanced stage, this is one of those things that if you can see what it's going to take um, to help you advance your career or with larger teams or architects that are trying to lead you through a solution, I think it's a huge benefit uh, to get an understanding of the overall process. Plug in the user groups, show up, network with your peers, meet the people you're going to be working with for the next 20 years. Somebody's gonna be your boss from that room someday.